This is part two of lecture 2a, kinematics and an infinitesimal of calculus. First part of this lecture, we'll learn how to solve physics problems using kinematics. So in this illustration, we have a, a jet taking off over the distance of a, the aircraft carrier. Starting with no speed, V naught, V initial of zero, given an acceleration, 31 meters per second. Notice that's more than three times the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration, also known as 3g or 3.1g. And it would reach with that acceleration in some time frame over this distance x that we're going to determine. It reaches a speed, we assume that's the final speed, of 93 meters per second. So pretty fast speed. Um, again, one meter per second is roughly two and a quarter miles per hour. So you can convert what that speed would be uh, in um, American imperial units. So our question is, how long is the jet accelerating, the duration, before it takes off, given these values? How much time, sorry, how much takeoff room does this jet need? And what is the average speed of the jet during takeoff? So recall from our previous lectures that we have four main kinematic equations. Our first one, how long you're moving, delta t, with some velocity, v. So how long you're moving, the v, and the delta t determine the delta x, your displacement, how far you've gotten. Now in this equation, if you have an instantaneous velocity, initial, or final, or min, or max, you wouldn't use it for kinematic equation one because there's only one input that can go into that one value that can go into that velocity. So you use kinematic equation one when you have uniform motion, constant velocity, you have one value of velocity, it makes sense to determine with that one value of velocity over some duration delta t how far you've traveled. If your velocity is changing, then what velocity do you put in for that velocity v in the kinematic equation one? So you'd only use it for uniform motion or the average velocity. The average velocity over that duration delta t would determine correctly the displacement you get. If you have non-uniform motion, motion with acceleration, then you use kinematic equations two, three, or four. Kinematic equation two, acceleration over some duration, so how long you're accelerating, delta t times a, determines your delta v, your change in speed. The third one is like the first one. The first term, your displacement, is equal to velocity times time, but that's your initial velocity times time. So how much displacement you would have gotten from your initial speed in that duration, and that's plus or minus, if the acceleration is with or against you, how much displacement you would have from that acceleration. So are you gonna increase your displacement or decrease your displacement from that acceleration given your initial speed? And if you have no initial speed, then equation three, the first term, b delta t, v initial, if it's zero, no initial motion, then um, your, your displacement is entirely due to your acceleration. If you have no acceleration, then your third term goes away, and kinematic equation three with no acceleration is the same as kinematic equation one, because with no acceleration, that's uniform motion, and three are the same as one then. And four, uh, is just found by substitution. We'll learn when we get to energy uh, a sort of a conceptual derivation um, for that one. So notice these kinematic equations, three of them have acceleration. Not all of them have displacement in there. Not all of them have time as a parameter. Some of them have velocity. Some of them have change velocity. Some of them have velocities at a moment or instant, initial or a final, and not an average or a delta v. So distinguish between which what the terms are. Don't just see v's and x's there and t's, right? We've got delta v's, we have v's, we have v finals, we have v initials, we have different velocities in these equations and some with acceleration, some with time, etc. Okay, so we'll have to learn how to use these. So in this problem, our first question was how long? That's a delta t. So the question is, what's our value of delta t? So what duration, or what time is the jet accelerating before takeoff? Well, on a problem, we're not given the time, so we have to calculate it using one of these or a combination of these uh, kinematic equations. 
So all we're given here is an initial speed, an acceleration, and a final speed, V naught, final speed, maximum speed, 93, and an acceleration. So looking at our kinematic equations, can we use kinematic equation number one to get the delta T? Well, we don't have delta X and kinematic equation one calls for displacement. We don't know the displacement and we don't know the time. So we have two unknowns in one equation. And that V is not V initial in kinematic equation one. And that V is not V final. It's not the 93 meters per second. It only reaches 93 meters per second, the V final, the V max at the very end. So kinematic equation one, recall, as I just said, is used for uniform motion or the average speed, which we don't, it's not uniform motion. And we don't know, we're not given the average speed. We can figure it out, we don't know it. So we wouldn't use kinematic equation one. We have two unknowns and the third velocity is, you can say, is unknown too, the average velocity. Kinematic equation two, we've got acceleration, time, and a change in velocity. Well, we're given the acceleration, so we can input a value for that in kinematic equation two. The delta T is we're looking for, so that's our unknown. And the delta V we're not given, but we can easily calculate it. Delta V, the change in velocity, well, V final is 93, V initial is zero. Delta V is clearly 93 minus zero. So in kinematic equation two, we can, e we can easily use Given the givens, the input of acceleration and the two velocities, we can quickly calculate the, the delta t. Could we do it for kinematic equation three? Well, we have time in kinematic equation three, what we're solving for. We have a v initial in kinematic equation three, what we're given. We have an acceleration is what we're given. So that's so far it's working, but kinematic equation three again has the delta x of displacement and that's unknown. So kinematic equation three has delta t and delta x, two unknowns and one equation, we cannot solve it. Kinematic equation four has a V final and a V initial. We have V final, 93, we have V initial, zero. We have an acceleration. So we have three things in, in equation four that we could input. But equation four has an unknown delta X and it doesn't have delta T, which is what we're solving for. So equation two would be the one we would use. How much takeoff room does this jet need? Our delta X, again, we run through the same scenario. Given what we're, what we're Solving for delta x, which one of those kinematic equations can be used to solve for delta x? Delta x is found in only three of the kinematic equations. Look to see which one delta x the displacement is not um, in, in those four kinematic equations. So of the three remaining ones, which one can we use to solve? And we can see by our givens how we can easily solve for delta x. So um, the first equation we now have solved for t, delta t. From, we uh, do still have not solved for v. Again, v is not 93, it is not zero. v in kinematic equation one is the average. We still don't know that. But if we knew the average speed, given the previous time we calculated, we can get delta x. So we could do it that way. Kinematic equation two would not be used, um, at least for the first step. Kinematic equation three, we can get delta x if we know v initial and t, which we just calculated, and acceleration we're given, and t, which was calculated. So we can use kinematic equation three because we have one unknown in kinematic equation three. That's what we're solving for, the delta x. But in kinematic equation three, the delta t is what we just calculated in the previous part. So what if our calculation is wrong or has an error? It's a little bit um, in error, meaning it's not as precise as needed then we would be propagating that error, whether it's the, the precision or it's, it's just perhaps calculated wrong in the previous part. So we'd be, we'd be passing that error into this one. In equation four, well, V final, V initial, we are given those, acceleration, we're given those, and our one unknown, delta X, is what we're asked to solve for. So four, we could use, and we can use that to get an exact answer because the inputs for four are based on our givens. The inputs for three, some of them, the delta t, is based on what we had previously calculated, and if that's not precise or correct, then we would be carrying that in to our next calculation. So four would be kinematic equation four would be better use, better to be used than three. Now, lastly, what is that average speed that we've mentioned a couple times and that would be used in kinematic equation one? Well, now that we calculated delta x and delta t, we can easily use kinematic equation one to calculate v and the average speed, and we would see that we can get the same value that we would by saying, okay, we have a constant rate of change, acceleration, we have two velocities given, an initial and a final. So with a constant rate of change, an initial and a final are two values, we can just say, okay, given those two values, divided by two, that's my average. And that should give you, both ways, the same answer, using kinematic equation one and that 
if you want to call it a fifth kinematic equation for how to calculate acceleration, how to calculate averages. All right, another one. Wordy problem here. Looks intimidating. You stop a car on an icy pavement. Ice is code for frictionless. So don't have to worry about friction. It's going on ice at uni uniform motion, right? Moving smoothly. But then acceleration of your car is approximately negative one meter per second on this icy pavement um, because it's pavement and it's ice. So I guess there's a little bit of acceleration, negative one meter per second. So I guess you're going forward because you're driving on an icy pavement at 30 meters per second, awfully fast to go on ice. But your velocity, 30 meters per second, is positive. Your acceleration is negative. You're slowing down. And you hit your brakes. How much distance will your car travel before coming to rest? Okay. So uh, looking at this problem, it's intimidating at first. But we, what we have is we have a given of positive 30 meters per second. We have acceleration that's opposite, slowing down. And we are told that our car is coming to rest. So it's implied that our initial speed is 30. Our final speed would be rest, zero. So our givens, the input, acceleration from the problem, initial speed from the problem, 30, our final speed is zero. This is how you sort of play the kinematic game. What are inputs? And with those inputs, the givens, what are we being asked to solve here before coming to rest? How much distance were they asked to solve for a delta x? That's our output. So given the inputs, which kinematic equation or combination of kinematic, kinematic equations, given those inputs, will give us the delta x, the output. So which of those kinematic equations can take a v initial, v final, some combination or all those to produce a delta x? That's how you play all these kinematic, the kinematic game for all these problems, all these physics problems. Okay, let's return, let's use these kinematic equations and return to what we learned previously in terms of plotting motion. So we got a position versus time graph grid here. Um, and that's corresponding to the motion illustrated for the person running. We can treat this person's motion as like a, a particle motion diagram. You can see they're covering at each instant. We assume the, the figures illustrated are over the same duration of time. And there looks like they're covering the same distance. So it's uniform motion or plot is also telling us uniform motion. How does the plot tell us uniform motion? The graph is showing that because there is one slope and the slope of a position versus time graph, the rise over the run, delta x over delta t is velocity, one slope, one velocity, one positive slope, one positive velocity, and that's the same thing in being illustrated, uh, uniform motion. So that's our first kinematic equation, delta x is v delta t. So this plot and this motion diagram are connecting those two ideas, the plotting of motion, plotting of uniform motion, the illustration of uniform motion, and the first kinematic equation, displacement delta x equals v, one velocity, uniform motion over some duration. So in this graph, we have from zero to four seconds. Any one of those values, or the whole four time, four seconds, can be put into that delta t. And our delta x is going from zero to 16. Any value of from 0 to 16 corresponding to the delta t can be put into that first kinematic equation to calculate the velocity, which would be the slope. So kinematic equation number one, delta x equal v delta t, is basically just a rearrangement of the definition of velocity, delta x over delta t, to give you an average velocity. Okay, so calculating rise over one, rise over run, delta x over delta t, is the same thing as kinematic equation number one. Or, as your textbook uh, prefers to do it, x final, v times t plus x initial. I combine the finals initials into the delta because that's physical, the change, where the initials and final positions are based on an arbitrary designation of a reference point of a zero. But it's the same equation. And again, when you're using that velocity in that equation from initial position, motion, constant or average speed to calculate the new position, the displacement, make sure that velocity is either constant or average that's being inputted there because you only have one value for velocity to go in there. Okay, came okay, my equation one with the graphical connection. Here is an example. The person looking at the illustration is clearly speeding up, covering more distance in time. Our graph is showing us the same thing. How do we see that in the graph of position versus time? Well, the rate of change of position versus time, the slope is increasing. We start out with a gradual slope and the slope gets steeper and steeper. If we're hiking up that slope, it's getting harder and harder. Greater slope, greater speed. Hiking up, increasing position over time, positive slope, positive velocity, 
slopes are increasing, positive velocity is increasing, getting ever faster in the positive direction, which could be up, which could be right, which could be forward, which could be north, which could be east, whatever the positive direction uh, represents. And we can measure the slope over some duration, some delta t, that's being illustrated here, in that five second duration. Um, we can see that the delta x, the change in position, is 20. So that's the slope there. At any instant, we can just measure some short durations over and see what the displacements correspond to get the rough estimates of the slopes that are ever changing on this um, ever increasing speeding up non-uniform motion illustration. Let's look at a, something similar with a problem statement and an equation for position. So we've got a graph. In this case, position is represented by S, position versus time. The slope is increasing on the graph in A, so we're sloping up. Velocity is increasing, getting ever steeper or greater in the positive direction, from 0 to 40 meters in 4 seconds. We can find different values of the slopes. They are given there to give us different speeds. We start out with a gradual slope. We're told it's 4 meters per second. We're getting to a steeper slope. At 3 seconds, we're told it's 12 meters per second. That curve on the position versus time graph is a function position s equaling 2 times time squared. That's their problem statement. Suppose the position of a particle as a function of time is position is equal to twice the square of time, where the position is measured in meters and time is in seconds. So what's the particle's velocity? So you can, of course, look at the graph and find the velocity, but that's not the point of this. How can we get from the equation, the function, to get the same velocity that's being displayed or told to us in this graph? So let's make the connection to kinematics to graphs. So what is the velocity of position s? Well, we know velocity is a derivative. We've done that in the previous lecture. You know this. It's the change in position over time or the instantaneous change in position over time, the derivative, ds over an instant dt. So that means we take the derivative of the function s. s is 2t squared. Take the derivative of 2t squared, we get 4t. And we can just see on their graph there that we're told that the velocity is 4 meters, uh, I'm sorry, we're told that in part b the velocity is 4t. So that matches with what we're graphically uh, being told. So we have a velocity that's not constant. And we can see the velocity is not constant from graph a. The slope is increasing. Non-uniform motion, our velocity is increasing. Our velocity is increasing with time. That's what that equation says. Velocity is equal to 4t. As time, if I put one second in, my velocity is 4. Put two seconds in, my velocity is 2 times 4, 8. Three seconds, my velocity is 12, etc. Looking at the graph on a, we see the slope is increasing from 4 to 8. Told it's 12. It's consistent. Graph in b, our velocity versus time is being plotted. Our velocity's value is increasing. At one second, our velocity is 4. Matches the equation, 4 times t. At two seconds, our velocity is eight on the graph. At two seconds, we find the velocity to be eight. Following that curve on part B, graph and B, velocity is increasing as time's going. Looking at time at three seconds on that curve, three seconds matches velocity of 12, same as our function, three T times three as the time, times four gives us a velocity of 12. Our velocity increases in time, directly proportional to time. Um, so that means we've got one slope and velocity. As we learn, that means we've got one acceleration. How do we get the acceleration? Well, one slope on our graph means one acceleration. We can calculate the slope. Delta V is the rise of the V versus T graph over the duration delta T. So our rise over run for part B, the graph, the slope, we can calculate. We can say 20 minus zero for our velocity divided by the time of four minus zero or anywhere on that from four to one or from et cetera, same slope. We can calculate that acceleration from the function. Well, acceleration is the, is the double derivative of position or the derivative of velocity. In all cases, we should get the acceleration to equal four. So again, we're connecting the calculus, the derivative, the function to the graphs, to the ideas of the kinematics of motion. And using the function, we can calculate the velocity in any instant. So that's another way. Looking at the graph, we can get an estimate 
or the slopes as they are changing to get instantaneous velocity, we would use the function to get a precise value at any time to get the instantaneous velocity, whereas the graphs we can just get rough measurements of the slopes. Another one, old quiz question. Potential energy, second half, the laser transition in the middle of the term, we'll learn about energies and potential energies. The common symbol for energy is U. So of two particles has a potential energy. Uh, these two particles are separated by distance r. And so the equation for the potential energy u as a function of distance r is a, which is a constant per divided by distance. So the energy is a function of um, is a function of per distance times some constant a. So the question is find the force that each particle exerts on the other. Of course, you don't know how to do this right now. This is a future. Uh, uh, in the future material, middle of the term, you will learn how to, to do this. And you will learn that the force is the derivative of potential energy with a negative sign there. It's the negative derivative. So the derivative with respect to distance r. So therefore, we just take that equation and take the derivative of that equation, take the derivative of u equaling a over r, take the derivative, throw a negative sign on there, and we get a over r squared. Some of you, if you stare at that equation, you may have seen an equation that involves force per distance squared. In fact, there are two prominent, important equations, um, laws of physics, if you will, that have forces related to the distance squared. One of them is gravity. Another one is um, the electrical traction repulsion Coulomb's law. All right, another graph of velocity versus time. In this one, we're gonna see how we can relate velocity graphs to change the position graphs, displacement. So a helpful way to think of the equation. Equation number one of kinematics, delta x is equal to v delta t, is that the displacement is the area of the rectangle formed by multiplying the sides on this, these rectangles, v and delta t. So the vertical of the graph is velocity. So the, the vertical sides of these rectangles that are plotted there is a change in velocity. So for the first um, speed of positive one. So over the first four seconds, we have some speed of positive one. This relates to an earlier graph of uh, walking um, four meters in a second and then walking backwards eight meters in, in uh, um, the next four seconds. So we've got um, a graph of four meters in four seconds or a speed of one meter per second for the first four seconds. So the velocity is positive one, and that's the height of this rectangle over the stretch of the rectangle, the delta t. So the area of the rectangle, the delta x1, the displacement. So since displacement by kinematic equation one, displacement delta x is equal to v delta t. So kinematic equation one is saying v times t is equal to x. v is our vertical, delta t is our horizontal, therefore it's the rectangle, the area under the curve. So one times four seconds, delta x must be four in whatever units of time and velocity we have. So that could be four meters. If the speed is one meter per second over four seconds, then delta x one would be four meters. Again, this goes to an earlier graph of um, position versus time where we saw that we were there in, at a twice as steep slope walking backwards, covering eight meters in four seconds for a speed of negative two meters per second. So again, velocity, constant velocity of negative two over a duration of four. So velocity times time, negative two over a duration from four to eight seconds. Four seconds times negative two is negative eight. So our total displacement, we add up. Delta x is equal to one times four. Delta x is equal to four. Delta x one is equal to positive four. Delta x two, four times negative two is equal to negative eight. So our total displacement, we went forward four meters and then we went back eight meters. And so our equation delta x total is equal to four meters delta x one plus negative eight meters. So we have a net displacement of four meters. So we went back more so than we went forward. Same idea here. Uh, another graph of velocity versus time. Again, we don't need the units here. Just the idea, we have values of velocity, we have time, we don't even have to even see what the times are to see what's happening here. Where do they, this is a person walking. This is a graph of their motion, V versus T, where they end up. 
Okay, so let's just see how we figure this out. The first rectangle corresponds to over some time frame, so the first few seconds or the first duration of time they're not moving. And then if, the, say, if this person is walking, then the first rectangle, they're walking with a speed of positive two miles per hour, meters per second, what have you. The speed is two, and that lasts over some time. And then their next speed is one, and that lasts what looks like the same duration. So they went for a speed of two in some time frame, and then the next time frame, you can call it one second, one minute, half a second, doesn't matter, but that same amount of time, they then went at a speed of one. So they went, we add up these rectangles, since they have the same width, the same base, then we can say, okay, the area is two times that base, and then one times the base for a total of three is the area. So the displacement forward is three, two plus one, and then their speed is zero for some time, and then we get another rectangle, a rectangle facing down for the next, for that same width of the rectangle, for the same duration, one second, half a second, one minute, what have you, for that same amount of time, then their speed is negative three. So they're going in the opposite direction with a greater speed in that same duration of time. So the speed v times t is delta x once again, negative three times that same delta t as all the others means that their area is negative three backwards and two, one, positive three forwards, we can easily calculate um, the net displacement. All right, our third kinematic equation, the long one here, is initial motion and change of motion. That's to be positive or negative acceleration. But in this case, we have a graph of positive acceleration. So we have a graph of V versus T, and our slope here is starting with some initial v initial speed a non-zero speed if it's a positive non-zero speed so you have some positive speed meaning just a direction and then our positive speed is going to increase because v final is greater than v initial and so our speed is increasing therefore we have acceleration we have one slope to a v versus t graph the slope of a v versus t graph is acceleration so in this non-uniform motion it's a constant acceleration one slope a constant increase in the velocity over time from v initial to v final. So we've got a positive velocity initial, a positive velocity final, and a positive acceleration. So our kinematic equation has that positive sign rather than negative sign because acceleration and the velocities are both positive. So we're increasing, we have displacement from our initial motion, and we are increasing the amount of displacement that we would have gotten without the acceleration. So meaning with just the initial speed, over this duration of time, we would have covered this rectangle here. V times T is displacement. So V initial times T is the initial displacement, the initial speed, the displacement we would have gotten from the initial speed. That's the first term in that equation. V initial times T, that's how far we would have gotten just from the initial motion alone. The second term, 1 half AT squared, is how much additional displacement we get from the acceleration. That's our delta X2. That's the additional amount of displacement from the acceleration. If our acceleration was negative, then our displacement would be going, would be um, reduced. So delta x1 corresponds, that rectangle corresponds to the first term, and the triangle, the area under the triangle corresponds to the second term. So notice that one slope is our acceleration, and that one slope creates the area under that one slope creates the um, an area of a rectangle. What's the area of a rectangle? One half base times height. What's the base? Time. What's the height? V final minus V initial. That's delta V. So that's why there's a one half in that, you can think about it as that's why there's a one half in that second term um, of the kinematic equation. All right, let's look at a question. Another V versus T graph. Look at our graph first. So the motion described is four meters per second. So we got some speed and that speed is constant for the first two seconds. And then that speed goes from four to three at three second mark, our speed went from four, I'm sorry, our speed went from four to two at the three second mark. And then our speed goes from two to zero at the four second. So we're going, we have a speed of four from zero to two seconds. And then we're going from a speed of four in the next two seconds, two to four seconds. The next two seconds, our speed went from four to zero. So we have a steady speed for the first two seconds and decreasing speed till we stop or have an instantaneous zero speed. So we're slowing down from two to four seconds. 
Okay, so here's the velocity graph of an object that is at the origin. We can't determine that from a velocity graph. All we see is the motion, steady motion and then decreasing motion. We have no idea where that motion is relative to some arbitrary x equals zero reference point. So we're told um, the, the object that is starting at the origin with speed, with some speed, speed of four at t equals zero. So any displacement we'll have from this graph will just be added to our initial position, in this case, zero. So at t equals four seconds, the object's position is where? How do we find this? The area under this curve is the displacement. So we can look at the area under the curve. We can count the, the square grids to count the total area. Or we can say, okay, from first two seconds, the area is a rectangle. So what's the area of that rectangle for the first two seconds? That's my displacement number one. My second displacement for the next two seconds, two to four seconds, the area under the curve is a triangle, one half base times height. Base is two seconds, height from four to zero. Height is four meters per second. So I can get the um, second displacement and add those guys up and then you get the total displacement. Or you can just count, uh, figure out the area of each one of those squares in the grid and you should get the same value. Okay, so those were examples in this previous example and others, this is a steady speed and a decreasing speed. Right? But what happens when we have an ever-changing curve where we can't just say, okay, we got a rectangle here and a triangle. We have simple ways of calculating the area in these graphs that I just did. Previous graphs, we can calculate the area by looking at rectangles under the curves or triangles under the curves. Uh, that's easy to calculate the displacement. But if our curve our plotted motion is ever changing, then figuring out the area under it isn't as simple as just saying is the area under it a rectangle or a triangle. So as you know, one of the techniques in the integral calculus is to assume that we can calculate the area using rectangles, but rectangles that are ever so thin so that they will approximate the area under the curve. So a little bit of the rectangle will stick out above the curve and a little bit below, and that'll um, schmear out so that we have uh, an accurate measurement with enough thin rectangles to represent the area of the curve. So as long as the delta t's, the duration, the base of those rectangles have some duration, then there's always, it's always going to be a rough estimate. But if we can have the areas, if we can have the rectangles to be as thin as possible, then we can best approximate the area of the curve. And thin as possible means basically no delta t, an, an instant of time, no width to the rectangle. So we have an infinite amount of infinitely thin rectangles, and that will add up to the area of the curve. So ever smaller rectangles, ever thinner rectangles, infinite amount of perfectly thin, no, um, no width rectangles would exactly add up to the area of the curve. And that's the idea of calculus. The idea being we add up a whole bunch of infinitesimal instance of time. So what does it mean to say it's an instant of time? Is that a billionth of a second or a trillionth of a second or some other number uh, of a fraction of a second? Any number you pick, whether it's a billionth or a trillionth, is still infinitely greater than an infinitesimal. No matter what number you pick, it's infinitely bigger than an infinitesimal. An infinitesimal is basically the inverse. Uh, it's the, the opposite, in a sense, of, uh, of infinity. So an ancient Greek philosopher in the fifth century BC named Zeno uh, had many paradoxes, only four of which survive. And those four discuss the issues of the infinity, of the infinite and the infinitesimal. And how this can lead to paradoxes of motion. So the Greeks understood, as we know, um, quite a lot of the early foundations of science and physics and math and philosophy in many areas, but they never embraced, they thought the infinite was absurd and they never developed, um, they developed geometry, but they never went as far as calculus because um, they sort of punted at the infinite. So let's see what the objection is to this idea of, as we use it, um, these Riemann uh, rectangles, this ever 
thinning rectangle, so we have an infinite amount of infinitely thin rectangles sounds absurd. Uh, and so that's what you do in your calculus equations. You take a limit, you sum up an infinite amount, and when your sigma, your sum, becomes infinity, we turn that into the interval sign, which is basically sigma is the Greek uh, letter that corresponds to our S. The interval sign basically corresponds to our letter S2, which is saying it's sigma, it's summing up an infinite amount of times. And so this means we're taking delta t to become dt, an instant of time. Infinite amount of instances, sum up an infinite amount of instances, that's an integration, which sounds quite, uh, quite odd. So Zeno has a few paradoxes. I'm going to make my own version combining a few of them to give you a taste of how this relates to um, conceptual issues with calculus. So uh, this is, and Zeno's paradox is Achilles is running a race. So that represents in the illustration there, Achilles. Achilles starts at the beginning of the race and he obviously runs the, the race till the end. So let's call this whole length one. And what Achilles is gonna do is um, going to cover this whole length, right, from start to end, from finish line, of course, and we are going to divide this track that he's running on uh, in half. So we have the first half, and then the second half of the track that Achilles is running, we're going to divide that in half to a quarter, and then that second half of that half, we're going to divide in half again to an eighth, and we're going to keep dividing every remaining half by half. So we divided the track by half, the second half in halves, that remaining half in halves. So we have a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, until, well, infinity, endlessly. We're dividing, as an infinity means, an endless amount. We have an endless amount of divisions of half. So this version, my version of Zeno's paradox is um, that Achilles is running, so he has to cover the first half of the track. Then he's got to cover the next quarter of the length of the race. Then he's got to cover the next eighth, and then the remaining sixteenth, and the remaining thirty-tooth, and sixty-fourth, etc. There's always a remaining amount. There's an endless amount of halves to go of the remaining. Endless amount of fractions, if you will. So then an endless amount of fractions, it may sound like he, an infinite amount of this, uh, Achilles will never finish the race. That's sort of the Zeno paradox. And the idea of the paradox, I've asked math teachers uh, a few times over my career and as a student and physics also, and I usually get back the answer uh, that the solution to this paradox is uh, with uh, the development of um, uh, the development of algebra and, um, and calculating with a series can go to finite uh, values or um, just uh, blows up. And uh, thanks to um, uh, calculus and, and, and uh, I'm forgetting, unfortunately, in this lecture, the name of that uh, calculating the, the series to see if it converges, a convergent series. You can calculate the series converges. What is the series? It's uh, you summing sigma one half plus one fourth plus one eighth. And using a convergent series test, you can say, oh, look, it actually is calculable, it's finite, and the answer uh, can be calculated. But the answer is obvious. It's a full track. It's a length of one. So one half plus all the remaining parts still adds up to one. The Greeks knew this. The Greeks invented geometry. They can certainly see that the summation of all this is one. Whether you have the tools of algebra for convergent series or not, the answer, of course, is one. So that's not the solution to the paradox. That's missing the point. The mathematical answer is just saying, we have the tools to make it calculable. But this is physics. Is this, is this physically possible that there is an infinite amount of fractions of a distance to be covered? In the sense, as an infinity, there's always a smaller amount to be covered. So let's turn this from the question of whether this is calculable. It clearly, uh, we have the tools to calculate it. It clearly, we know what the value is to a discussion of the tasks, the physical tasks. Let's say we put a flag and mark the first half uh, with, the, with a flag. And then the next quarter, the next, um, and the next one, and the next one. We put flags at each one of these fractional amounts, each one of these halves of halves of a half of a half of a half. How many flags do we have to plant? Endless amount, an infinite amount, because there's infinite amount, infinite amount of these fractions. So we're endlessly planting these flags. We have an endless amount of tasks, an infinite amount of flags, infinite amount of tasks to do. So you may object and say, okay, well, we know it can reach the end. 
We can even say, all right, so it's going to take the planting of the flag. Let's say it takes a half a second to plant the first flag and a quarter of a second later to plant the next one and an eighth of a second after that to plant the next one and a sixteenth of a second after that to plant the next flag. So we know all those fractions of a second still add up to the whole one second. In one second, infinite amount, endless amount of flags have been planted. Fine. Let's mark those flags. The first flag will give a number three. The next flag will give a number one. The next flag will give a number four. The next flag will give a number one again. Next flag a number five. Next flag a number nine. And then it just goes on endlessly. I'm sure all of you recognize the series of numbers that are being placed down. This is the numbers, um, the first few numbers of the endless infinite series pi. So my question is, what's the, what's the number on the last flag? So this should give you a conceptual issue as to how can this possibly be the case. So if Achilles is truly running through all this infinity of fractions, it's the same thing as saying he'd be passing, he could have passed by an infinite amount, endless amount of flags, each with a number. And then you can just look back at the end of the, at the, at the finish line, just look at, look at the last flag in front of the finish, right before the finish line and see what the last number is, which would be the last number of pi. But of course, pi has no last number, it's endless. There's an endless number of flags. How can you ever complete this task? That's the physical paradox that Zeno was trying to raise. I heard another example um, that you can say, slip a light switch on and then off and then on and off. Flip the light switch on half a second. For the first half a second, you flip the light switch on. Then the next quarter of a second, you flip it off. Eighth of a second later, you flip it on. Sixteenth of a second, flip it off and so on. And then after one second, you flip the switch on and off endless amount of times, infinite amount of times. After one second, is the, is the switch up or down, on or off? Again, this is showing us that there is quite a conceptual conundrum with using infinities and infinitesimals. Yet we use, um, oops, yet we use calculus to, oops, yet we use calculus, the infinities and infinitesimals, in physics ubiquitously to calculate motion and it does so extremely well. So using infinities and infinitesimals in math and physics uh, helps us uh, um, predict, calculate, estimate, um, and describe our universe. Yet we don't really have examples of infinity uh, in the universe, but yet the, the math for it uh, seems appropriate. And another of Zeno's paradoxes, which I'll give you, uh, that relates in, this is relating to the integral and in integrating, summing up an infinite amount um, and by the way, um, space uh, expands, and so empty, empty space, excuse me, expands. Um, and if, uh, if there is an infinity of fractions of empty space, then we can have an infinite amount of expansion. So there is some physical correlations uh, that can relate to this paradox. Another one of Zeno's four paradoxes is the idea that we can relate to the derivative. So thinking about um, dx dt or at any derivative, right? dx, the numerator, is a change in position in this case, and the dt re represents the idea of a change in time. Rather than a delta t over some macroscopic amount or some duration, it's a dt, an infinitesimal, infinitely smaller than any possible measurable time. So you would think that in an instant of time, there would be no displacement, no motion, Yet what we do is we say an instant of time dt, there's some measurable amount dx, some displacement, some motion. Yet infinitesimal dt means there's no possibility by definition of any smaller time. So if it's dx, if it's being displaced or moving in that dt, then you can't possibly say there's any smaller amounts of time that it's covering uh, that motion. Another way of saying it is, in an instant of time dt, you'd say maybe that uh, you'd have um, that instant, right, a um, sort of a, uh, a picture of the motion. So let's say Achilles shoots an arrow, and at an instant, you take a look, a dt at an instant, you're looking at that arrow, that arrow would, for an instant, look like it's sort of hanging in midair, right? For one instant, it's at some position. So at each instant, you'd think the arrow is at a different position if it's moving. moving. Every instant, it's at a different position. That would be a, a sensible way of describing motion. 
The paradox is, if that's the case, then as Zeno says, um, how is that different from, say, an arrow that is suspended in space by Zeus? Um, so suspending an arrow in space, how is that different? A motionless arrow suspended in space, how is that different from an arrow at any instant traveling through space? Right. So any instant, the arrow would be at one position, the same as if it was Zeus just suspending it motionless. So every instant, the arrow is motionless. Yet we add up an infinite amount of instances to describe motion. Each one of the instances, it's motionless. Infinite amount of motionless would still mean motionless, according to the, the rationality of this. Yet, of course, that's not what happens. We add up an infinite amount of these, and we can describe the motion accurately of any object. Another way of thinking about it is, how do we even, what's, from one instant to a next, what connects those times? If it's like a film strip from each film is connected together along the film strip, what connects these instances? What stitches together moments of instances of time? These are all questions that Zeno has raised and never been uh, satisfactorily answered. Or from the great webcomic XKCD, Integral calculus and derivatives does work to describe, to describe uh, motion and many other things in uh, our universe. And so physics, we use calculus because it works and it works terrifically. And so the rules of calculus apply for, uh, for physics. So here we have an integral, we break that integral. Um, you know the rules of integration, or at least you should. And the second part, um, one of the rules there is we can take two functions and separate them uh, as being shown there. Okay, so make sure you're familiar or get familiar again with, uh, with uh, various common um, integrals. And that is it.